Let's do the intro. All right. So um, hi, everyone. This is Ijo Caro from CBEF. Uh, thank you guys for joining us today. Sorry, um, AJ um, couldn't join. He had some internet issues. And uh, sorry, my face isn't on. I also have internet issues. So I'm kind of doing this from my phone. But I would love to um, welcome Dr. Parag Patel and Dr. Um, Joseph Adams um, coming in to talk to us today from the Foundation of International for International Cardiac and Community Services, Global Fix. Um, they gave us such good um, presentations the last two times they were here. And I'm so glad that they were able to um, come in today to speak to us about navigating the world of EKG readings. So take it away, Parag. Thank you, Ijeoma. This is such a pleasure. Uh, we're excited once again to be a part of this process. Uh, Joseph Adams, you can see his picture there, is uh, helping present today. He's a cardiology fellow, a first-year fellow at Lutheran General Hospital in Park Ridge, Illinois, um, where he'll be uh, still uh, finishing two years of additional training. Um, Let's get started. Some familiar uh, strategies that we talked about last uh, few sessions on how to look at a rhythm strip, and it's also useful for looking at a 12 lead electrocardiogram. Um, today, we're gonna expand on the rhythm aspect and move into uh, some EKGs that are 12 lead and systematically approaching a 12 lead, sort of demystifying and taking the fear out of trying to evaluate uh, an EKG. Uh, and I think this is so important for many of you to take the fear out of learning so you can establish a foundation in concepts and then build. Joe, why don't you give them a quick overview of this busy but important slide that uh, we feel is sort of our distillation of the ACLS algorithm to try to simplify things. So um, here you can see, uh, this is actually put together by uh, Dr. Nasarallo, who's um, our uh, education content and medical director for the, for the um, organization, put this slide together. And really, the, it goes back to even the first slide that shows the questions that we want to ask when approaching EKGs. But this is more so at the bedside in a clinical um, kind of algorithm that you can follow. And really the most important question when approaching any EKG is adding context to it. And by adding context, I mean, is the patient stable or unstable? Because that kind of determines um, the meaning of the EKG or the meaning of the interpretation of the EKG. So by stable or unstable, meaning do they have a pulse or not? And this, you know, in, in some ways, and Dr. Patel always kind of when he teaches this, tells us when the patient is unstable and does not have a pulse, it's almost easier to treat because um, what you have to do is, you know, start chest compressions, deliver electricity. Um, and so the, the uh, algorithm becomes a little more tricky when the patient is stable, has a pulse, because then you have to really kind of think about, um, about what, the, what the underlying diagnosis is. Um, so that's really the most important piece to this is whether the patient's stable or not. Then secondary questions like, is the rate fast or slow? Is the QRS wide or narrow? This These questions will help further differentiate the etiology of the underlying rhythm and, the, and, the, and what's going on in the EKG and will help um, guide your treatment. And so, um, you know, if the patient's got a fast uh, rate and the QRS is wide, think of VTAC. Um, if the rate is fast and the QRS is narrow, think of SVTs. Either way, treatment for those in unstable patients is uh, synchronized cardioversion, right? And so um, then on the slow, st on the slow side, um, you know, if, if they're slow, unstable, you're thinking about pacing the patient. Um, and so getting their heart rate up to improve cardiac output. Uh, and then again, 
fast or slow, wide or narrow, stable or unstable. These are the vital questions that you should be asking each time you approach the bedside, each time you look at an EKG. These are the questions you should be thinking to yourself because they'll help uh, guide the differential and help uh, guide management. Great. So this is something I'd recommend. Uh, you can take a screenshot of, or we will get you the slide deck. The slide deck will be posted uh, later this week. Uh, so you'll have access to that. Very basics, fundamentals, right? In the EKG is understanding duration. So we're all speaking the same language. Uh, understanding, is there a P wave? What is the PR interval? QRS, morphology and duration clearly establishing where that J point is so you can assess ST segment changes, looking at your Q to T interval, and then identifying and separating a U wave from a P wave. So basics, fundamentals, uh, vital, so we all are on the same page as far as the language and how we speak. And, and back on, if you can go back to that slide, I just want to add to that R to R interval. Um, that's a great way for assessing whether the rhythm is regular or irregular, looking at the R to R intervals um, between each beat and seeing if, if there's variation between the R to R intervals is a great way to kind of globally look to see if the rhythm is irregular or regular. Excellent point. Again, rate, make it simple, understand the ECG uh, and the, the scale that it's on. Uh, simple techniques are outlined here, uh, but I think it's vital for you to be able to eyeball an EKG and determine the rate. Certainly everything we have now in medicine is digitized and rates are placed, but as many of you know, particularly in the digital world of rhythm assessment with leads on a patient, the monitor can give you rates that are not in, that are not correct because of artifact. Often it oversenses and the rates will be very high or will undersense the R wave and the rate will be incorrectly low. So it's important for you to be able to visualize and assess the rate. Um, again, strategies to try to walk through what are rhythms, you know, do we have a QRS? We've talked about it. Is it narrow or is it wide? Are the R to R's regular? Are there P waves present, not present? And then what is the range of supraventricular arrhythmias that can exist? And again, over time, we're going to cover these. We're going to show you the examples of them. So there are many supraventricular arrhythmias all of which are listed there in the blue boxes. Again, more about intervals, understanding the small box represents 40 milliseconds, a larger series, the larger box inclusive of small, five small boxes, 200 milliseconds, and being able to translate that into second. Also important to note the distance here as well, because um, when we're talking about ST segment elevations and depressions, which we will on subsequent slides, um, you'll want to note that each small box, so it's not only time, it also gives you distance. And so each small box is a millimeter. The five small boxes or one large box is five millimeters. So when we quantify ST segment elevation or ST segment depression, that's how we do it. When we say there's three millimeters of ST segment elevation, it's based on one, the J point, and two, how many small boxes the ST segment is elevated. So that's just, again, trying to define um, the language that people use to um, describe EKGs for either when you're talking to a consultant uh, or when you're, uh, you know, the consultant yourself. Um, it's good to have uh, established language so that you can clearly uh, describe what you're seeing on the EKG. 
again, a little bit about the segments. And again, these are fundamentals, basic concepts that are vital to understand as you evaluate. Electrocardiograms, right, are graphical representations of vectors that have magnitude and direction. Magnitude and direction of the vectors then determines what we're interpreting on the 12 lead electrocardiogram. But understanding the principles of the ECG and then intervals that you need to measure is vital to then diagnosing clinical syndromes. And so, again, another example of, of understanding that. Um, Joe, why don't you talk to them about the importance of the QT interval briefly, and then... Yeah, so um, the QT interval is important um, because of specifically because of syndromes like QT prolongation um, and um, the vulnerability period of, of, of causing syndromes like R on T, um, as well as leading to things such as torsades. Um, and so <clears throat> part of assessing the QT interval, um, and even when administering drugs that can uh, prolong QT as many of them can. It's important to um, kind of remember that when you're assessing the QT, look at whether or not back to the original, one of the original questions that we talked about is the QRS wide or narrow, because that can affect the QT um, calculation. And so um, the, especially when you're getting a, the read from the machine on an EKG, uh, oftentimes they do not account for the width of the QRS. So you'll get a prolonged uh, QTC, but you have to know to uh, correct for the um, QRS duration. And the way to do that is you subtract 120 milliseconds, which is a constant, minus the QRS that you're seeing. Um, and then the calculated QTC minus that number is what the true QTC is. Um, and so... Um, just some tricks um, to to remember and uh, to use when when uh, when assessing the QTC. Very good. Again, these slides will be made available. We want to introduce basic concepts, but give you that sense of how to calculate. Joe, take them quickly through a QTC calculation. Yeah, so here you can see um, the QTC measured to be 500, okay? And so what you're seeing is a wide QRS here. Um, and so when you take the QRS duration into account, you're taking 137 milliseconds, which is the QRS duration you're seeing on the EKG, you're subtracting 120 milliseconds. That's the correction for the wide QRS, and you're getting 17. You take 17 minus 500, and you get 483. That's the corrected QTC accounting for the wide QRS. So you notice there's a difference, and it can be the difference between what we would say is a prolonged QT versus a not prolonged QT. And so it, it would change your potential differential um, and whether or not you need to be concerned about the QT. And um, so it can be important. Excellent point. Again, thanks, Joe, for making that simple for us. I think the QT causes a great deal of anxiety for many, but really understanding when there is a prolonged QT uh, Ijeoma, you can maybe chime in here. We get so many consults for the prolonged QT. No, I agree with basically what you said. Um, when looking at the QT, there are a few things that you want to look at. And I think that you've already touched on this. First thing is the rate, you know, and the QTC becomes important, especially not only at the slow heart rates, but also at the very fast heart rates. And so you might think that somebody does not have a prolonged QT because, you know, it seems short um, because the rate is a little bit faster. But then when you correct it, you realize, oh, actually, this is actually pretty long corrected for the heart rate. Um, and there is some controversy um, as to whether you do correct as much for a really slow heart rate, um, which you would expect the QT to be prolonged for 
Um, so would you treat it as aggressively as you would one um, that is prolonged? So, you know, those two things you definitely have to think about. Um, the conventional wisdom is that you don't really correct for a slow heart rate, but you do correct for a fast one. Um, and um, of course, everything is corrected to a heart rate of 60, which is basically where all the QT intervals are based off of. Um, and then the other thing, definitely correcting for a prolonged, trying to figure out if it's prolonged because you have a prolonged QRS. So for those patients who have left bundle, right bundle, you know, commenting on a prolonged QT might not necessarily be necessary because, you know, the QT interval might be prolonged because of the prolonged QRS, as has already been stated. Thank you. And as many of you know, these forums that we're providing, uh, the beauty of it is, is that it is, it's a team-based approach we want to teach with a variety of skill and background to give you different perspectives and hopefully simplify some of these concepts that can become anxiety and fear producing. Well, this is, I think, germane to uh, sort of the foundation of the Cardiovascular Education Foundation, some of the work that A.J. Hale has been doing in promoting the recognition of diseases that need therapies. And uh, Joe, why don't you walk us through uh, this in a timely fashion? So um, it's essentially um, trying to separate out um, blocks or AV blocks that require um, intervention, or at least the, to begin to think about whether the patient will require a pacemaker um, versus the blocks that traditionally don't require pacemakers or don't require intervention and can be safely watched or monitored. Um, and so just from top to bottom, you're seeing a uh, first degree AV block. This is kind of review from our previous talk where we talked about um, uh, arrhythmias, um, but you can see the PR again, important. That's why it's important to know the intervals um, as well as to commit to memory, maybe some of the more important um, uh, interval lengths. And so PR greater than 200 milliseconds, right? In that first EKG, you can see the PR interval is prolonged. That's a first degree AV block, something that you can safely monitor. Then you have um, Wanky Bach or Mobitz type one, which are interchangeable uh, terms. Um, and what you see here is PR pro sequential PR prolongation. So the PR interval gets longer and longer and longer before a dropped beat. Um, this again can be kind of uh, anxiety provoking when you see a P wave and don't see a QRS followed by it. But if you take some time to fully assess the preceding beats, um, you could recognize this as a type one, second degree Mobitz type one block, which can be safely monitored in most situations um, and does not require therapy. And then the bottom three are um, high grade AV blocks, including uh, type two, second degree block, um, which does has dropped QRSs without the uh, PR uh, prolongation. Um, like Movitz type one does, this is a um, malignant AV block that often requires pacemaker evaluation. Um, then there's the um, uh, third degree uh, AV blocks, um, which, you know, have um, P waves that do not correlate with QRSs. There's complete dissociation of the P, P wave and the QRS. There's complete AV dissociation. And these oftentimes require pacemaker evaluation. So it's important to recognize the differences and, um, and get the patient the appropriate evaluation by the appropriate uh, consultants. Excellent. We are gonna move through uh, quickly here some techniques for access again. These are really pattern recognition. Remember, we're talking about vectors with magnitude and direction and a simplified approach to how do you determine what is the axis. And again, it's not uh, a process that I'd anticipate takes you a lot of time. It's really pattern recognition. Uh, so Joe, what's a technique for a trainee that you would quickly give them to give for them to understand if it's normal 
if it's right or it's left. So I I have it marked here um, in this uh, in this diagram here to the left uh, upper left of the slide. Um, I when I teach to the medical students or you know even to uh, the residents, I use this technique that, and I'm sure many of you are familiar with, up in one, up in AVF, uh, meaning the deflection of the QRS is positive in one and positive in AVF. Um, would mean a normal uh, axis. Um, and so using one and AVF as kind of your guide in terms of determining the axis is how I would uh, approach this as an, you know, as just starting off and as a trainee. Um, so using one and AVF. So then you can go to the next slide. So in here, you can see the positive one deflection in QRS and the positive one def uh, deflect QRS deflection in AVF. And then here you can see there's a positive QRS in one and a negative QRS in AVF. So the vector is moving away from AVF, which is the inferior, which is an inferior lead. So moving away from it, going to uh, moving towards a left axis deviation. Um, and so up in one, down in AVF, left axis deviation. And that's outlined in the EKG here. And then the next slide, you can see right axis deviation. So down in one and up in AVF, the vector moving towards the inferior leads, right axis deviation. And I would say to focus on those three, um, there is extreme right axis deviation as well, which would give you negative deflection in one and AVF. Um, but I think... Uh, at the trainee uh, entry level, I would focus on left axis deviation, normal and right axis deviation. Great. We're making a shift here, and this is where we transition to looking at the electrocardiogram is, and it has giving us an opportunity to see which part of the myocardium might be at risk for ischemia. And so we're looking at now breaking down the 12 lead electrocardiogram into geographic pods. So I think most uh, are familiar with the left anterior descending, the LAD distribution leads V1 through V4. Uh, and then if a diagonal branch is involved, leads one and AVL for a very large dominant LAD, you may include all the way out from V1 to V6. Inferior or right coronary artery distribution involving leads two, three, and F. So coming down, wrapping around um, in very large inferior ST elevation myocardial infarctions, you'll see substantial ST depression in the anterior leads. And so looking for patterns where there's elevation and then reciprocal lead ST depression is then building your case that there is an ST elevation myocardial infarction. When you see ST elevation without depression, you wanna broaden your differential diagnosis to consider other causes. But always ST elevation, the number one on your list for the differential diagnosis has to be an acute myocardial infarction, ST elevation, MI. The circumflex artery is the one that can be the great masquerader. You could see only ST depression in the anterior leads. You might just see ST changes in V5, V6 on occasion for a very large circumflex with large obtuse marginal branches or ramus intermedius one in AVL. But it's an index of suspicion that has to be high that someone is presenting to the emergency department with classic symptoms, including diaphoresis, maybe nausea, vomiting, a discomfort and uneasiness, chest or arms, difficulty breathing, and your EKG is unremarkable, continue to investigate. Uh, I'd like you to leave today understanding that to diagnose ischemia, you need serial electrocardiogram. So have a low threshold in any cardiovascular rhythm or ischemia assessment to repeat the ECG, get more data, it's a dynamic process, as we'll talk about moving forward. This I like to put in because this was created by, uh, you know, the EMK Foundation in Kenya, the Emergency Medicine uh, Kenya Foundation that uh, we've had 
the honor of working with for a number of years. And I, and I think it's a very concise and simple way to approach acute coronary syndrome. Uh, you see that right from the beginning, when you have a chest pain diagnosis, you want to have a broad differential. What are the life-threatening causes that would present as chest discomfort? So our differential diagnosis has to be weighted on life-threatening. It's acute myocardial infarction, pulmonary embolus, aortic dissection, tamponade. Non-cardiac must be included, pneumothorax and esophageal rupture. Those are life-threatening causes of acute chest discomfort. The EKG is the only way to distinguish whether you're having a STEMI. So the fear of the EKG is what we're trying to get over in this series of presentations. It's vital to tackle that fear because when there's fear, you won't order the electrocardiogram. Once you order it, right, you are now accountable to read it. And that's why we want you to become familiar with pattern recognition. Understanding the nuances of a 12 liter electrocardiogram are not necessary for most of you. It's understanding pattern recognition of life-threatening presentations. And that's what we want to keep discussing and, and presenting to you and having you feel confident in picking up. And so this is how we're going to navigate now looking at the spectrum of acute coronary syndrome, including non-ST elevation myocardial infarction and ST segment elevation myocardial infarction. All on a continuum, it can be occurring at different time frames within the same presentation. And that's why the serial electrocardiogram, the 12 lead, is vital because you might pick up the transient ST elevation, which now moves that patient into the another box that needs more urgent care. This is going over sort of the time is myocardium. Every minute that goes by that and a coronary artery is occluded, oxygen is being deprived to the myocyte, and the myocyte is necrosing. And as time goes on, more myocytes necrose, so you go from a subendocardial injury infarct to a transmural infarct as time progresses, the likelihood of complications also increases. And we'll talk about some of the complications over time. So we really want to make the diagnosis early. The only way to make it early, particularly if it's a STEMI, is an electrocardiogram that's interpreted properly. This is a great summary slide of the entire pathophysiology on the top, plaque, plaque rupture, platelet aggregation, cross-linking of fibrin to trap red cells. You go from a white thrombus to a red thrombus. EKG serially picking up either ST elevation or ST depression as a marker of subendocardial ischemia and infarction. And it's the combination of using your cardiac enzymes, your EKG and the clinical history to make the diagnosis. And most importantly, Joe, tell them what's the most important therapy? <laughs> the most important therapy is aspirin. Immediately give aspirin when you're, um, when you're concerned about uh, acute coronary syndrome. Uh, it's something that um, is cheap. It's extremely effective. Um, and it has been proven in clinical trials uh, to, to improve mortality. And so aspirin therapy should not be delayed um, in, in, in acute coronary syndromes. Joe, what if I present to the emergency room with an acute MI, you've given me aspirin and I have emesis and vomit. Do you give me another one? Um, I would probably, I would look for different routes. If I, if I'm concerned that you, in fact, uh, you know, uh, aspirated or, or, um, vomited it out the aspirin i would probably uh, move to rectal route um, some sort of uh, different route to ensure that that's how important it is so i would make sure that you you got the aspirin whether it's orally or rectally um, i would i would give it a different way thank you that's vital aspirin is the most important therapy in parts of the world that have 
resource limitation, aspirin is effective. We're going to show you the data on how effective aspirin is. I would encourage all of you at the end of the session today to go get some aspirin and have it with you because that is therapy all of you can provide any patient who might be having an acute coronary syndrome. The risks of giving aspirin as a single dose up to 324 milligrams is zero. There is no immediate risk to giving someone 324 milligrams of aspirin. So if you suspect acute coronary syndrome, please use the aspirin and make sure that they have been able to absorb it so it can be uh, helping prevent the platelets activation and then importantly, the aggregation. A little bit about who we are, sort of almost at the midway point, right? We are a foundation based in Nairobi. Our principal uh, mission and values centers around a concept of educating, elevating, and empowering. We do it through healthcare training. We focused largely on young women in Kenya, uh, but are also involved in a number of the emergency medicine and cardiac uh, conferences and training throughout East Africa. Through this link, we have set up, uh, and we mentioned last week or a few weeks ago, an opportunity for you guys to be trained online in basic life support and advanced cardiac life support at a deep discount with one of our partners. Um, and so go, please go to our website, investigate. Um, it's a it's an outstanding online program. Certainly doesn't take the place of getting training in person. And so if there's interest in doing that, uh, you can reach out to us via the website. And if you're in a region or at a meeting we're at, we run many of these training, hands-on training sessions. Please uh, reach out. All right. We're going to hit uh, have some fun now. So let's, uh, let's have... Uh, Ijeoma and Joe help me maybe uh, get some responses to this electrocardiogram. And again, sort of systematically, right? Is it fast or is it slow? Is the QRS narrow or wide? Uh, is it regular or irregular? Do we see P waves? And then now we've added ST segment analysis. Is there ST elevation? Is there depression? And in which leads? So we'd like some feedback. We'll, uh, certainly you're welcome to chime in. The moderators will let you in or just enter into the chat some responses and we can start to. Actually, I'm going to call on one of our uh, attendees, first year cardiology fellow, uh, Cyrus. Dr. Cyrus, please join us. I don't know if we have to unmute. There you are. Yes. Uh, thank you for inviting me, Dr. Parag. Um, Please introduce yourself briefly because you'll be you'll be a part of this forum and helping us teach moving forward. Excellent. Yeah. Hi, everyone. My name is uh, Cyrus Munguti. I am a, a first year cardiology fellow at the KU Medical Center in uh, Kansas City. Uh, prior to that, I did a residency in uh, KU in Wichita and stayed on as faculty for about five years. Um, and before that, I trained in Kenya. I went to medical school in Moy University and did a residency at the University of Nairobi and worked there for a couple of years, about uh, 11 years, actually. So I have a broad-based understanding of the Kenyan landscape uh, and healthcare, both in, in Africa particularly in Kenya and East Africa, as well as the U.S. So I have a, a passion for cardiology, and that's how I ended up here. Um, and I've uh, met with Dr. Parag and the FIX team and been part of the teaching in, in Africa STEMI, and, and, and I'm greatly excited to be part in part of this uh, lecture series. So Cyrus, so, help us walk through this. We've set a basic premise up, right, of these techniques we use. Um, so I'm going to run through and, and you can walk with them, right? So is this rhythm fast or slow? I would say it's uh, it's a bit fast. It's more than 100. Good. So it's right at the 100. So it might be some tachycardia. Is it regular or irregular? It looks regular to me. Agreed. So again, even the eyeball test, it passes 
Yes. Uh, do we see a P wave before each QRS? So these some kind of P waves, yes, uh, before every QRS complex. So I would say it's a sinus rhythm. Great. And so then we have now added to this um, discussion the ST segment displacement. So maybe you can walk the audience through where is it elevated, where is it depressed? Yeah, so just going through lead one, two, three, um, one, two, three AVF, generally looking at the inferior leads, those um, look, look a bit stable. I'm not seeing much depressions in lead one. Um, lead two and three, some sort of questionable ST segment depressions there. Um, but then when you go to the uh, anterolateral leads uh, in lead B1, B2, um, you start seeing some elevations, uh, but they are more marked in the lead uh, four, five, and six. Excellent. And so the first therapy would be, Cyrus? Uh, so the first, you know, obviously you activate the cath lab, but then you give aspirin. And how, what would you tell the patient to do? Do they just uh, swallow the aspirin? Do so they... it's best if they chew this aspirin um, for fast action. Good. So chewing the aspirin allows it to be absorbed more rapidly. And remember, the goal is to get absorption of that aspirin. To, it works as an anti-inflammatory, but it's a potent platelet inhibitor. So yes. Excellent. Thank you, Cyrus. Uh, now we have a whole different rhythm. Uh, let's get someone online to help us walk through this. Uh, I don't know. Ijeoma, if you have someone you can see, I can't see the names of the participants on my screen. Someone we want to have them elevate themselves in front of the audience, or maybe. We can well, all does anybody want to um, like raise a hand? Because I would hate to. Yes, we have a safe learning environment. Ijeoma is much kinder than I am. I would, if I had your names in front of me, I'd be calling you out. <laughs> She's a color <laughs> human. I, I, I can confirm that. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, let's see if someone steps up. Oh, it looks see? like Joel. Yeah. yeah, hello. My name is Joel. Hi, Joel. Thank you for volunteering. Okay. All right. So, uh, um, so this First, is... Uh, Joel, please tell us where are you based and a little bit about okay. your... Right, your okay, so I'm in Ghana. I'm in Ghana. Yeah, uh, I'm a third year resident in internal medicine in uh, Ghana, Kolibu Teaching Hospital. Outstanding. Welcome. Thank you for uh, joining and st stepping up. Okay. All right. Thank you. Okay. So um, basically, um, what I see are broad uh, QRX complexes. Uh, um, the, the it looks like a, a ventricular tachycardia, um, with uh, you right to the diagnosis, which is outstanding. For those that may not have your experience, Joel, how yeah. would you describe the rhythm before you came to the conclusion that it was ventricular tachycardia? Okay, so the 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 broad um, QRX complexes that you see. Um, you can't actually see any P waves, and um, the um, the rhythm is actually it's, it's actually fast. I mean, I think right. it's about uh, this this. Let me see, cure is it more more uh, almost about a hundred and fifty beats. So that's actually a tachycardia. Um, okay. and the, uh, you're, you're spot on. So I think again, pattern recognition, it's a fast rhythm, wide QRS, and it's regular. So fast, wide, regular, always VT until proven otherwise. If the patient is clinically unstable, it does not matter whether it's SVT with some form of aberrancy or VT, right? So we want to learn that fast, clinically unstable, narrow or wide, is often going to need electrical therapy. 
So Joel, if this patient's blood pressure is 70, they're having chest pain with this rhythm, what's your treatment? 70 systolic. Okay, so that's an unstable rhythm, and so you would want to do a cardioversion. Excellent. So that would be something you want to, you know, walk through. Thank you, Joel. I appreciate your input. Okay. So here we have a rhythm, and let's see if we can get someone engaged. Um, again, we want to think of rhythms in a fashion of whether they're fast or slow, narrow or wide. Is there a regularity? Is there a P wave before each QRS? And what do we have uh, in our audience on this rhythm? If you type in an answer in the chat as well, we could um, we could do it that way too. Um, I'm monitoring the chat. So if people want to just put their answers into the chat, it may be. Yep. We're any way you okay. want. So Dr. Giram uh, stated AFib. Um, it went right to the diagnosis. Okay. Great. Yeah. So uh, um, how did they come to that conclusion? Uh, Joe, why don't you? So you can see the R to R intervals. So first, you know, we talk about, is it fast or slow? Um, uh, I would say that even though it's hard to determine uh, the rate in patients that have such an irregular rhythm, this is certainly not fast. So it would be slow. Um, is the QRS wide or narrow? It's narrow. Um, and is there a P wave before every QRS? And really the, the answer is no. Um, there's really no um, P wave correlating to every QRS. And it's certainly the R to R interval is irregular. So uh, when you have an irregular rhythm with uh, absence of P waves, most of the time, irregular rhythms with absence of P waves, the most common is probably AFib. And so think of AFib. Um, and so because this patient's, if this was a fast rhythm and the patient was clinically unstable, what would the, the immediate therapy be? So let's chime into the chat. If this patient's rate was 150 um, and there's um, and there's no, and the blood pressure is 70 over 40, what would be the immediate therapy? So there's a question. Um, Cardioversion yeah. is the right answer. Yeah. And, and oftentimes AFib, um, a flutter, you can get coarse, uh, course a fib um, and so that is probably what we're seeing in in v1 um, and so you know um, the irregularity to this um, you know a flutter although it can be irregular is often regular um, but certainly there can be patients with course a fib um, good yep that's a good response. All right. I did want to mention, so somebody had said something about TEE and then cardioversion. Um, and, you know, it's important to note that if it's an emergent procedure, like if the patient is, you know, tachycardic, decompensating, the TEE is not necessary. So in a patient that is clinically hemodynamically unstable, you just cardiovert. Yes, they could have a blood clot, but, you know, in the face of imminent, you know, deterioration, really what you want to do is stabilize the patient and then deal with whatever comes out of that, you know, afterwards. So definitely Great. if the patient is unstable, you cardiovert. Now, if the person is stable, even if they're tachycardic, then you have the time to start thinking about, okay, what could be causing this patient to be tachycardic, um, tachycardic? Are they tachycardic because it's AFib or are they tachycardic because there's some other, you know, um, process going on? Are they hypoxic? Are they, do, are they having an MI? You know, are they in decompensated heart failure? You know, all of those things. So you don't necessarily have to cardiovert in that case, even if the patient is tachycardic. But if the patient is unstable hemodynamically, 
definitely cardiovert, no need for TE. Great point. And, and just for the audience, again, we have varying degrees of sophistication. So the TEE is a transesophageal echocardiogram. So something that's going to allow us to directly image the left atrial appendage to see if there's thrombus in it. Um, and that's as it's been stated, right? If we have the luxury of stability hemodynamically, then we do do proceed that route. Instability threat to them, we would move to cardioversion sooner. All right. Who wants to take a stab at this one? So we've got an electrocardiogram. Again, we're showing them to you in a variety of sort of formats because there is a great deal of variability uh, around the world and how the 12 lead electrocardiogram is presented to you as the clinician. So it takes a moment to orient yourself to understand where the leads are. Uh, and then you are now assessing. So do we have any risk? Uh, volunteers yeah any volunteers or anybody wants to place something in the chat yeah if you do want to volunteer you can raise your hand and i can let you speak it looks like our oh, okay doctor from Ghana oh, is ready to go yeah. again let's put him on the, let's put him on the spot dr joel Okay, thank you. So um, there are ST elevations seen in um, leads uh, V2, uh, V3, V4, and V5. And uh, there are reciprocal ST depressions in 2, 3, and AVF. So um, looks like uh, um, an anterior lateral uh, STEMI. Outstanding, right? So yeah. you've got exactly the view identified pattern recognition. Uh, uh, Joel, in your setting in Ghana, please tell us your next step. You, this is a 56 year old man with mid sternal discomfort. He's diaphoretic, nauseous. He's hypertensive. He's sitting in your casualty department. What walk us through what you can do and offer this patient. Okay. So, so uh, typically in Ghana, we would um, start the patients on um, the um, aspirin and then activate the cap lab. In some parts of the country, we are, we are not able to um, uh, access the, the cat lab. And so we would manage them conservatively, giving um, the uh, dual antiplatelets and um, also giving a, a DOAC whilst um, monitoring the, while we continue monitoring the patients. And those who are able to afford, because we have to pay most of the time out of pocket, the cat lab is, uh, is activated and um, anticoagulation is begun while we prepare the patient for stenting, PCI and possible stenting. Joel, how about TPA therapy? Thrombolytics? Okay, so, yeah, Thrombolytic. okay, so Yes, yeah, so um, that's also quite expensive here. And okay. so in some patients, um, they were able to do the uh, TPA for them. That's most of them who are maybe far off, who we need to start thrombolytic therapy before we start PCI. Um, we can do that. But most of the time, because of cost and the availability of a cat lab, we, we often end up managing most of our, our patients with... Uh, um, conservative, I mean, conservatively, Great. unfortunately. Yeah. Thank you for that insight, Joel. Okay. Now we've got something that's interesting. Who would like to take the opportunity to interpret this? No, what should we call it, Ichioma? The privilege. Who would like to have the privilege of interpreting? this electrocardiogram. And again, it's important you describe patterns and then learn over time to ascribe a diagnosis. The diagnosis will come to you if you systematically assess the patient. Um, and this might be a good one if we don't have somebody. Um, oh yeah, we already have a response. Yeah. Dr. Giroum and Dr. 
uh, and Pofo Bubi both uh, said Torsad. Excellent. And so why don't you, uh, Joe, walk us through from left to right? What are we seeing in this electrocardiogram? So initially, um, you're seeing what looks to be um, on the all the way to the left, you're seeing normal sinus uh, um, conduction. Um, there's it's the QRS appears to be normal. There's P wave before every QRS. The rate is also normal. Um, and then the beat, the one, two, three, four, the fifth beat um, looks to be um, an ectopic uh, beat or not, or different than the others, um, which then seems to trigger this, um, this ventricular uh, arrhythmia here. So you can note that it's a wide complex QRS, it's fast. Um, and as people correctly pointed out, looks like uh, torsad. Um, and so, um, yeah. Yep. So that's spot on. And Igioma, we had talked and Joe, you had set up, what is going on with the QT interval in those first three beats? Um, yeah. So you can basically see there that if you look at lead two, I think would be probably the clearest one that you could see where you can see that the QT interval is it doesn't seem at first glance to be long, right? So it's basically looks to be about 440 milliseconds. But then when you look at, you know, the beats kind of going further, like if you look at um, the third beat, it looks to be even a little bit longer. And when you correct it for the rate, then you realize that it's actually pretty long. And a real, um, quick way of trying to figure out if your QT interval might be long for the rate is that it should be less than two thirds of the RR interval. And so if it's a little bit more than that, or if it's a little bit more than half the RR interval, then you are fairly certain that it could be um, long. Um, and this one seems to be long by that measure. And so if you were to correct it for the rate, you'd realize it was actually, even though 440 isn't that long, by the time you correct it for the rate, it's a little bit more than 490. Um, and that would still be considered to be long. And you have this QRS that just happened to fall on a vulnerable part of the QT um, segment. And that's why you're going into polymorphic VT. Outstanding. That's a great tip. And so anytime that T wave concludes after the mid portion of the R to R, be suspicious that it's QT prolongation. That's a pro tip that simple T wave is going beyond the midway portion of your two R to R intervals. Start to be thinking that this could be QT prolongation. Okay, let's get back on the plumbing side of things, maybe. Who do we have in our chat box that's going to jump out and help us assess this rhythm? This is a 67-year-old woman presenting to the emergency department with fatigue, shortness of breath, and right arm discomfort. She's becoming nauseous and casually. You have your casually colleagues who are now getting concerned. Oh, uh, Dr. Kobina uh, raised their hand, so we can. Good. Let's unmute and get. Let's hear a, a voice. Hi. So my name okay. is Kobina from Ghana, same hospital as Joel Kolibu Teaching Hospital, also a third year resident. Excellent. Okay. Welcome. Thank you. So looking at this ECG, the rate is about um, one, two, three, four. So like 70, 75, it's not fast. I see a P wave before each QRS complex. So it's in sinus rhythm. Then in lead two, three and AVF, we have ST segment elevations. And yes, S is meant elevations. So I think there's like an inferior MI, inferior myocardial infarction. 
Excellent. And so you've made the diagnosis. Your treatment is? So as all um, uh, MIs, we, we need to start anticoagulation with aspirin. But we need to check if the patient is stable and then resuscitate accordingly. If the patient is hypotensive, which may be seen in inferior MIs when there's a right ventricular involvement, then we have to start fluids as well to prevent them from going to shock. Absolutely. Good. All right. Thank you for your input. All right. Oh, Dr. Patel, before we even move on, yeah. since this is the second MI that we've talked about, yes. um, we talked about TPA in, um, you know, the prior case. Um, and I know that the streptokinase is a little bit more available. Um, can you tell us a little bit about the difference between those two medications and, you know, um, how, what your experience, if you've had any experience with them and what your experience has been? So I, that's a great question. I'm going to jump ahead to a slide that might be my favorite slide in cardiology, uh, which will help us understand at least how and why we treat acute myocardial infarctions the way we do. This is from the ISIS trial in 1988. So I want you to go back. Might be before some of you were born. Many of you probably. <laughs> uh, but this shows that in an acute MI population, they randomize patients. Now, just try to think of this. They randomized an acute MI patient to placebo. They randomized one arm to receive aspirin alone, another arm to receive streptokinase alone, and then a combined streptokinase and aspirin arm. And this was a, a landmark milestone study that showed us that the pathophysiology of an acute myocardial infarction was related to platelets and aggregation, and that as you inhibited platelets with aspirin, it had virtually the same impact as a potent thrombolytic streptokinase. And so this is the basis for our therapies and how aspirin became a public health initiative because of this impact, having nearly the same absolute mortality benefit as a potent thrombolytic without the risks. So the downside to the streptokinase, it's an outstanding drug of someone who's having an MI and at risk to die, it's, it, it is the therapy of choice, often because of cost. It can have some increased immunogenity where people do get reactions to it. It can have a higher risk of serious bleeding, intracranial hemorrhage, and even systemic bleeding. So we have moved away from it to the next generation of more specific thrombolytic agents that have less bleeding risk and maybe a slightly improved efficacy. But streptokinase is certainly, you can see the synergistic impact of putting aspirin with streptokinase has a substantial absolute risk reduction. And so it's, it's state-of-the-art therapy in many resource-limited areas. It's good therapy. So if you it can get it for your patient, it can have a substantial impact on outcome. Thank you. We do have, and again, I'd like, I don't want to keep all of you too long, but I certainly want to give you opportunities. Uh, this is a nice electrocardiogram uh, that illustrates a number of things. So let's see if we've got someone who wants to take this opportunity to learn and teach us. Oh, Dr. Kobana, did you want to answer this question as well? Or is there anybody else who wants to raise their hand? I see Dr. Soa is saying SVT in the chat. Okay. Yeah, Dr. Soa. So do you um, mind walking us through? Let me see if I can let you speak here and then maybe you can walk us through how you came to that conclusion. Okay. Um, so uh, uh, from uh, Confanachi Teaching Hospital, uh -huh. uh, when I look at the ECG, I can see, uh, you can see here is that preceded a P wave. 
So it's a sinus. Just that the KYS complex is narrow. Narrow KYS complex with uh, the heart rate is almost about 150 uh, milliseconds. So in conclusion, you can say it's supraventricular tachycardia. Good. Any other comments, Joe? Yeah, so I would say, you know, you're absolutely right. It's a um, it's a fast, narrow, complex, regular rhythm, regular uh, intervals, uh, tachycardia. So absolutely right. Um, this is an SVT. Um, and so if I'll ask you, Dr. Soa, if the patient's blood pressure is 60 over 40, what would you do for this patient? Uh, what you will do is uh, we need to slow down the heart rate uh, by with uh, anti arrhythmic drugs. Then, uh, yes, well, when the heart rate is slowed down, the patient, the blood pressure begins to come up. Mm -hmm. So, we normally give uh. Uh, sometimes we okay. can also do cardioversion yeah. in order to Good. bring down and bring down the blood pressure, bring up the blood pressure. Yep. Yeah. So I would say if the if the patient's hemodynamically unstable, I would say the first uh, therapy here would be cardioversion. Um, if the patient's hemodynamically stable in this rhythm. You can use vagal maneuvers, carotid massage, uh, having the patient bear down, um, and then moving towards medications like adenosine um, so that you can uh, break the, the tachycardia. Um, but if they're hemodynamically unstable, I would um, move towards cardioversion. And it's also Good. very important to realize that if you have SVT, I mean, the EP and me always loves um, you know, adenosine, because it does have kind of a, um, it does have a diagnostic um, utility, um, as well as being a treatment utility. So sometimes, you know, in very rare cases, you can find, let's say an atrial flutter that's two to one, having the same, um, you know, same um, appearance. And so sometimes you just kind of need to um, figure things out. So that's why I like using adenosine. But if you do use adenosine, please remember that it has a very quick onset of action um, and then you have to basically push it really quickly and push um, 20 cc's of fluid. So I usually use a three-way stopcock, push in the adenosine, either six milligrams or 12 milligrams. And then immediately after that, 20 cc's of saline really quickly, like an IV push um, so that you can actually see the treatment effect. Because if you don't, then you might think that it didn't work when it was because you just didn't push it fast enough. Excellent point. So adenosine can be your friend. Uh, I also, and it's been rare, and Ijeoma, please tell me, but uh, have had one instance where I pushed adenosine and they went asystolic and did not come back. So when you give these drugs that can have profound bradycardia, you must be able to keep your patient perfused. And that may mean chest compressions. Ideally, you would have access to a pacer transcutaneously because of the short acting half-life, you should get a rhythm back. But on occasion, both cardioversion and using adenosine is going to make an individual asystolic. And you have to be able to handle the complication of your therapy. Uh, we will be uh, doing a session on techniques in cardiology. A few weeks ago, we talked about cardioversion defibrillation. Uh, we're going to also talk about some vagal maneuvers. So we'll, we'll show videos on how to perform those maneuvers and then the potential risks of doing things and how do you get yourself out of those complicated scenarios. All right, in the interest of time, I'm going to pick a few that I think are, are illustrative on different fronts. So let's have a, a volunteer uh, try to take 
this EKG deconstruct it, demystify it, take the fear out of reading it. So it's pattern recognition, it's a systematic approach, and then it's action. This EKG requires action. So let's have a new participant try to, to weigh in. Oh, there's a question while people are looking at this that I see online, the difference between SVT and sinus tachycardia. So the way I look at it, and certainly uh, Ijeoma weigh in, SVT is sort of a larger categorized, it's a label for a category, supraventricular tachycardia. Now, your question online was, is sinus tachycardia an SVT? And it is. It's a supraventricular, but it's not a pathologic supraventricular tachycardia. It's more, it can be physiologic, driven by demand, whereas the other arrhythmias or dysrhythmias are pathologic. They are not a part of normal nor demand. So that's, I think, the way I, I try to encourage people to distinguish. But Ichiyama, any other thoughts? No, you explained it definitely very correctly. So SVT, you know, technically includes all tachycardias that's supraventricular in origin. So technically, AFib is an SVT, atrial flutter is an SVT, you know, our regular AVNRTs, even what we classically call SVT, it's not really SVT by itself, right? It's either AVNRT or AVRT, but we just call it like a short form, hey, this is SVT. Um, so it's a larger category. Um, and then you have the individual diagnosis. So a sinus tachycardia, you definitely have that P wave that is coming from the sinus node, which means it should be positive in the inferior leads as well as biphasic in V1. And it also has to be positive in the left-sided lead, so it should be positive in one and AVL. So if it's not any of those, then it's not coming from the sinus node, and it could be an ectopic atrial tach. But um, a sinus tachycardia is definitely, you know, something that is as a result of something happening physiologically. Thank you. That's excellent. All right. What do we have? Anyone stepping up? I am actually quite impressed that I've... Our participants are sticking in with us. So there, I'm hoping is some value to what we're providing today. Anybody want to volunteer? Cyrus, why don't you uh, join in again and help us navigate this if you're still online? We may have lost our first year, Cyrus. Joseph, help us. Okay. Um, so <clears throat> this is a um, patient. You can see um, there's there's kind of a lot going on, but um, for the majority of the beats, I mean, there. The, if you look all the way on the left, um, this does appear to be um, a, a sinus um there are P waves. There are some distractions because there are extra beats or ectopic beats um, coming in. So you'll see that, you know, in the on the left first third of the of the rhythm strip, there's a premature uh, ectopic beat followed by probably a compensatory pause, which makes the R to R interval look irregular. Um, but don't get distracted by that. Um, the big thing in this EKG is in um, the anterior leads, the V1, V2, V3, V4, V5, and, and even in V6, you see profound ST elevations. Um, and so that's really what to focus on in this EKG. Good. This is a real world assessment. So this is an EKG that represents the challenges of trying yeah. to <laughs> TVP is superimposed within segments that are grossly distorted. The ST segment elevation here is profound. There is the pre-existence of a bundle branch block. There are Q waves in leads V1, V2, V3. So it's more representative of what we see in reality uh, and not on tests. I'm going to jump through. Um, maybe go to the... Um, Here? No, to the next one. We can do some of the ones that have like... 
Uh, nope, next one. Oh, you tell next me. Next one. Next, this, this, yeah. go back, go back. Let's see this one. Yeah. Okay. All right. So let's uh, systematically, let's see if we can get someone to participate here. We are starting to see some drop off in our participation as we've gone well over the two o'clock mark. But this is a, a an excellent EKG to get comfortable with. Uh, and understand. So uh, please online even uh, just enter your responses and then we can uh, walk you through. But certainly if there's a volunteer who'd like to. Dennis has raised their hand. Great. Let me try to unmute him here. Oh, go ahead, Dennis. Uh, hey, guys. Welcome. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I'm Dennis, for those who don't know me, a paramedic here in Kenya and part of Global Fix team, which is training on BLS and ACLS. For this, I'd just like to note the elevation on lead two, lead three, and AVF. Uh, so inferior stem will be the diagnosis here, which... I would immediately want to give aspirin as soon as possible. And also, I would want to avoid nitroglycerin at all costs. Um, yeah. So that's, that's outstanding. Uh, and I think for the audience, it's important. Uh, Dennis, uh, just go ahead and repeat. Again, uh, what your training is and uh, and your role within the organization, please. Okay, so as I said, I'm a paramedic here in Kenya. I trained with St. John Ambulance. And currently I am working with Global Fix, MedSwipe, and a couple other companies, specifically training on emergency medicine from first aid, BLS, ACLS, and hopefully many more to come. Outstanding. And review for us again what you found. So your interpretation of this EKG is? Was inferior STEMI due to the elevation on the lead two, lead three, and AVF. And you said there were some cautions about this individual patient and how to treat them? Yes, I would not want to give nitroglycerin due to the, its action. Uh, it would cause a uh, lower uh, cardio output. And this will just worsen the situation even more. Excellent. Thank you so much. Appreciate your input and uh, your diligence. So I think for the audience, right, to understand that as a paramedic, uh, Dennis is taking the initiative to learn at a level beyond what his formal training is. And, and I think it's the lesson here is that it's pattern recognition and then it's your initiative. If you take the initiative, you can become an expert without formal training. You can learn these uh, things and it's just practice and repetition that's going to make you you know, good and outstanding. Thank you, Dennis. Uh, uh, Joe, what are we looking at here on this same patient? So if you have um, a technology um, point of care ultrasound or ultrasound technology available at your institution, I would strongly, strongly encourage you to, um, to get good at it, to learn it. There's tons of resources online. Uh, we offer the course at Africa STEMI annually on point of care ultrasound techniques, um, but it is something that you can quickly do at the bedside. Um, you put the probe on the patient's chest and here what you're seeing in the first clip is um, a short axis view of the left ventricle. Um, and so, here at the left ventricle uh, on the right of the screen, right ventricle on the left of the screen, you're seeing the anterior walls moving and squeezing well, and the inferior walls not moving. This adds to your suspicion of um, 
inferior on my, the inferior wall is not contracting, as you can see on that first image. So it adds to your suspicion. It gives you an idea of the patient's ejection fraction, um, whether you're going to be anticipating cardiogenic shock um, and, and whether or not this patient may end up requiring additional support. And so it's just an invaluable tool that um, if your institution has available to you, I would strongly, strongly encourage you to take the initiative to get good at using. Excellent. Thank you. So, you know, using ultrasound, vital. Go back one. Go back, go back. 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 Same patient. An hour later, develops this. So first you have the inferior STEMI, you confirm it with ultrasound, you start to deliver the therapies we've talked about, aspirin, anticoagulation, um, et cetera. And then the patient develops this rhythm, this EKG. The, patient, the nurse calls you back to the bedside, patient's hypotensive, um, is altered, has altered mental status, is hypotensive, and has this EKG. Being the astute clinician, you ask for a repeat EKG, and this is what you see. What is it? Any volunteers? It's a complete heart block. It's a complete heart block. And what, how are you getting to that conclusion? So... When you look at it, uh, the QRS complexes are wide and they are far apart. And so the pacemaker now becomes uh, below the AV node. Excellent. You also see multiple P waves that do not have QRSs in that long period without QRSs. You're seeing... Uh, no association between the P waves and the QRSs. If you were to take calipers, the P waves would march out. So absolutely correct. This is complete heart block. Why did this patient develop complete heart block? So, so the um, blood supply to the AV node comes from uh, the right coronary. So most likely the MI affected uh, the AV node and so complete heart block. Good, exactly. Thank you, Cyrus. And the initial treatment for this? Hemodynamically unstable. So you need to, you need to pace the patient. Absolutely. Um, so transcutaneously pace this patient um, would be your initial therapy until you were able to get a more stable line or a transvenous temporary wire into the patient while you're attempting to revascularize the patient, either with thrombolytics or with going to the cath lab. Oftentimes with revascularization, in inferior STEMIs, the complete heart block will resolve. Not always, um, but oftentimes with revascularization, um, the the um, the complete heart block will resolve. So remember to think about this as a potential complication for inferior STEMIs. Great. So complications of an MI can be categorized generally into electrical and mechanical. And the electrical complications of an MI that we worry about the most are the ones that represent this. So I want everyone to look at this and tell me what their first reaction is. What, as the clinician, if you see this on a rhythm strip, certainly if you get a 12 lead of this, which we don't often get a 12 lead of this, uh, what is the diagnosis and what is the immediate treatment? I wish we could start a timer. Is there a timer on any of these? Pius uh, responded. Defibrillate. v Excellent. Excellent. And so uh, disorganized rhythm, ventricular fibrillation, not compatible with perfusion, 
needs immediate defibrillation. This is a challenge, um, and I'd like to get some idea. We've got 63 participants online. Please chime in to the chat. The question is, do you have access in your medical facility to an AED or monitor defibrillator? And please just uh, enter your response in a quick, do you have access to it, yes or no? I think this is, again, something that all of us are working on collectively through multiple organizations on how do we bring uh, appropriate technology and education to uh, parts of the world that do not have it. What are we getting uh, for some responses? Ethiopia. Uh, on SPHMMC. So we're going to look at here the responses on this electric cardiogram while people are still chiming in and see if does somebody want to take a stab here at this EKG, which is vital to to understand and get to the bottom of. Any volunteers out there in chat land? Are we seeing anybody stepping up? I'm um, not. Not. All right. So then why don't uh, you take this one, Joe? So again, um, systematically looking at this, it looks to be um, a regular rate. Um, it appears to be sinus. There are P waves before every QRS. Um, and the QRS appears to be narrow. Um, and so then we look at the ST segments. There are ST elevations in the anterior leads um, in V2, V3, V4. There are reciprocal ST depressions in 2, 3, and AVF. Um, there are even elevations in 1 and AVL as well. Um, so yeah. Good, so this is again, pattern recognition, quickly assessing ST deviation, elevated, depressed. Which leads, does it fit a pattern? Is it confirmatory? If it is, I quickly need to take action. Action being activating whatever system you have available, whether it's a thrombolytic, whether it's the cath lab, it may just be aspirin. Be certain as the, the clinical officer, as the bedside physician, it's your responsibility. It's not good enough for someone to tell you, yes, I think they received aspirin. If in doubt, repeat the aspirin. I showed you the data from ISIS-2. The impact of aspirin is almost equal to a thrombolytic. Give the additional dose of aspirin if you're not certain they received aspirin. Many facilities, sadly, that I've been in and heard from some trainees and physicians around uh, parts of East Africa do not have, the facilities do not have aspirin. So I would urge you as a medical professional, get a bottle of aspirin, keep it with you when you're rounding on duty, you can give someone literally out of your pocket a life-saving therapy simply by giving them aspirin. So please, as you leave today, I want you to leave with that at a minimum, that you have the ability to change the course of a disease by just giving aspirin if it's an acute coronary syndrome, particularly an ST elevation myocardial infarction. What do we see here, Joe? This is the oh. echocardiogram on that previous patient. So again, you'll see the the left ventricle here in the middle of your screen. Um, the right ventricle is up into the left uh, of the screen. It's anterior 
The top of the screen is anterior. So that's how you know it's the right ventricle. You see um, this is a short axis view of the left ventricle. You can see the way I like to do it, I, if you put your hand and cover the bottom portion of the left ventricle and the top portion of the left ventricle and do it that way by segments, you can see that if you cover the bottom portion of the left ventricle or bottom portion of the screen with your hand, you'll see the anterior wall, right? Top of the screen, anterior, anterior wall is not moving in and out. Now do the same thing, cover the top of your screen or the top portion of the left ventricle, and you'll see that inferior wall is moving in and out. And so this, again, confirms your suspicion of an anterior myocardial infarction um, and gives you information on uh, how the patient will do and um, it gives you idea of the ejection fraction as well. Outstanding. Well, in the again, to be fair to everyone, we've gone over our time allocation. I appreciate uh, certainly all the input, uh, Ijeoma, Cyrus, Joe, uh, the participants who helped us come to the conclusions we did. Certainly, we're going to be repeating and reinforcing these concepts. Uh, and uh, so feedback would be useful. Um, I'd encourage you also go to our website if you're interested in getting a certification that's online. Uh, and if you want to reach out about hands-on training, again, uh, send us uh, a notification. Uh, other comments, Ijeoma? Uh, maybe to close. Dr. Patel, yeah. oh, oh, yes. Oh. There's a question um, about, and I'll, I'll defer this to you because you okay. teach this on rounds uh, a lot to the medical students and, and, and residents. But there's a question from Dr. Awur. I'm sorry if I'm mispronouncing that. What are the risks of continual use of other NSAIDs in oh, uh, MI or post-MI? Outstanding question. Um, Non-steroidal anti-inflammatory agents should not be used in any cardiac patients. They have a negative impact um, on neurohormonal uh, systems uh, increasing the release of angiotensin II, so you're getting vasoconstriction. Uh, it's harming the kidneys. It's putting a strain on the ventricle by elevating the LVDP. Um, certainly, it increases the risk of gastric mucosal injury. We're giving aspirin. We're giving antithrombotic agents. We might be giving even more potent thrombolytics. Uh, so in cardiovascular patients, you want to avoid NSAIDs because they contribute to heart failure, atrial fibrillation, renal insufficiency, and potentially bleeding. Um, so it's, it's important for all of you to uh, educate your healthcare colleagues as well as patients on the negative impact of non-steroidal anti-inflammatory agents. Great question. Thank you, everyone, for coming. We really do appreciate it. And thank you for all the, you know, involvement and all the participation. Um, thank you to Dr. Spatano, um and his group for in Global Fix for always being there and um, definitely giving us such an excellent presentation. It's been great. Um, so please reach out. Please make use of the resources that we um, have made available for you today. And then also um, CBF, we have our Nigerian Cardiovascular Symposium that we hold every year. If you go to the website, cvefonline.org, and I'm going to put that in the chat, um, that will um, allow you to register. Um, it's going to be in the month of August during the weekends. Um, and so we hope to see you guys there. Um, but um, thank you so much, everyone. All the best. Happy Sunday evening to those uh, that are farther out in the African realm and good afternoon for any of you on the U.S. side. All right. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.